Okay, so we've done this actually. We went outside. We had just two graduated cylinders. We got a little piece of tubing. They have these graduated cylinders, a little piece of tubing sticking out the side. We filled it with water. We set it up on a pile of bricks and we let the water flow out for a few seconds. Okay. So there's water in the tube. You can see that. We got little waves here. A little shark stem sticking out of that. That's how we detect water, right? Because there's sharks in water. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're small. Who wants to come out of the water fountain? We've got the water from a real small shark. The pins aren't really that big, it's small. But there are always sharks in water, right? Okay, right, so uh, uh, the hypothesis and testing. Uh, say for the right conspiracy minded people, they'll believe you. Okay. Uh, the water level is at some height H. Okay. And the tube is at distance A above the ground. So when we release my thumb off the tube, the water flows out as a projectile, right? So we have now this distance here, what is called delta X. Okay. Delta X. So we've got a high A and a delta X. And we could just remove the delta. And we could even call A what? And now we've got uh, the height Y and the horizontal range X. So we can get the velocity. So I'll call it the axis. The velocity exit in water. Can we observe? That X decreases as H decreases. Okay. And the potential energy. Decreases as H decreases. X and velocity decreases as H decreases. Because of course, if X decreases, that means your exit velocity decreases. Okay. So That A cylinder and A2 be the cross sectional areas of the cylinder and the tube. I think the tube has an eighth of an inch diameter. The cylinder has a diameter we could easily measure. So we could verify all this. And we could set up a mathematical model. Okay. So called the surface 
the velocity of the water surface up down. Okay, so we have some velocity. The surface. Okay. Surface is moving downward at some speed. The decreases in time because it's pretty obvious intuitively that the velocity here decreases, which means less water is flowing out. And if there's less water flowing out, then you're losing less water up here, which is going to cause this to change more and more slowly. Well, turns out, and this should be fairly obvious, If you multiply the speed at which the surface is moving downward by the cross section area, you get the rate at which volume is changing. Okay. You might have to think that through a little bit. You want to think that through. Um, if you accept this, then Rate of volume change multiplied by the density times G. And the rate of your gravitational potential energy change. Okay. We can put that in more mathematical terms. We went a little bit, but I'm writing it out. We think about it more conceptually rather than looking at a bunch of symbols and trying to figure out what they mean. Understand what the symbols are going to mean, and then we'll write out the symbols. Okay. Um, So the rate of potential energy change equals that's the velocity which we can calculate from observations just the projectile. You know how long it takes to fall from here to here. You divide that into how far it goes, you find out how fast the water is moving. I'm going to use rho for density. I think that's inclusive. Maybe not. So it's not a kind of thing that's going on up here, so I know. And that's as close to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So the rate of PE change is this. Rho and G are just constant numbers. So that's just a constant. Area of the tube is constant. So the rate of potential energy change is the exit velocity times something that's constant throughout the whole process.
No, let's make sure I've got everything up here. I know what I want to say. That's a pretty nice here. Velocity of the surface times the area of the cylinder equals velocity of the axis. X of the water times the area of the tube. I can change V axis times A to the V surface times A cylinder, right? And that's my color I'm looking for. It's a little hard to do because my peripheral vision is kind of blocked by the mask. Okay. This is the same as this. It has to be equal. The, the reason I have to be equal, incidentally, is you can't compress water. At least you can't compress it much. Okay. If you change, uh, if your water depth is like six miles, you get maybe a fraction of a percent change that you could actually measure. Water depth of tens of centimeters, no significant change. If water is incompressible, anything that comes out of here has to be lost from here. Well, okay. Uh, so for that reason, these two things have to be equal. This is what's lost from the cylinder. This is what flows out of the cylinder. The only way it gets out of the cylinder is the flow out. And now, what's the rate of potential energy change? Well, I've already written it. That's a good. This is kind of what I wrote. Let's see. Um, you know, I'm going to write it again if necessary. Rate of potential energy change is velocity of surface times the area of the cylinder times the OG. And that's what I just wrote down here. Velocity of the surface now I'm regretting my notation down here. If I call this Y. I really want to call this. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Velocity of the surface is. The HPT. Agree? That makes sense. It's a rate at which the height is changing. If velocity of surface is three millimeters per second, then this height here is changing at three meters per second. It must be real explicit. Let's say this is height as a function of T. Indicates that it's not just the initial height, it's a height changing in time as soon as we unplug the cylinder, it becomes a function of time. Okay, so we can do DHDT. Oh, 
Okay, now I'm going to go up for a second. I'll make the assertion that the rate of potential energy change is proportional to the height. Okay. Now, this does require the thing that I told you you couldn't use pressure. Okay, so this is from analysis of pressure. It's also observable. Which we can observe. By just observing how far this moves in a short time. Or by how fast. Or is it okay. um, this is a differential equation. It's very easy to solve. So before we get into pulling the details here, let's look at how we solve That's a simple differential equation. Now, what of you has a differential equation course? Okay. Coming up, that'll be tomorrow. Okay. So, suppose maybe else, but probably didn't. Anyhow, you got dH dt equals C times H. That's easy to solve. Yeah. dH over H equals C times dT, right? So we integrate dH over H, we integrate C with respect to T. Well, but you integrate 1 over H, you get natural log of X. Because the derivative of natural log of X is 1 over X, right? Well, this is H instead of X, but this is going to be the natural log of the absolute value of H. And then we'll see dt is just a constant integral of dt is t, right? And we usually use c for an integration constant. But probably should use something else for this constant. We would not normally use a for this constant because we kind of associate that with some harmonic motion. But name of the constant doesn't really matter. So I'm going to call it. And then plus an integration constant. 
there's an integration constant in this side too, but it could be subtracted from the one you get on this side and still have a constant. So that's okay. So the H equals absolute value of H is E to the KT plus three. Find the inverse fraction. So it's E to the C. And he would say two. Now, you're going to see this differential equation. You might as well see it here. So the I don't want to have the portal. So, eight. So, eight meters of KT, where A is greater than zero. Now, I realize that I wrote down something carelessly here. It doesn't work at all. DHCP is not constant times H, it's a constant times the square root of H. So this equation here has K square root of H. So that the H of the square root of H equals K T. So that, well, what's the antiderivative of one over the square root of H? So you just take derivative, you know the derivative of the square root of H is one over two square root of H. If you don't know that, you've got to practice this. Get a college book. And do 200 derivatives. Okay. So this should be, sorry, two square root of h equals k2. Plus the integration both sides and the integration. So the square root of h is kt plus c over 2. So the h is kt plus c over 2, quantity squared. That's the quadratic fraction. Okay, well, we've got a little ways away from the whole idea of potential energy. How do we get the HDT as a constant times the square root of H? We've got to use the idea of pressure.
precious force for unitary in terms of well, what are the units of force? Newton, what are the units of area? What are these? Pascal. Yeah, it sounds for Pascal. That's the two. Okay. I can't tell what I'm doing, but there's your high level. So I've got a line here. If this is eight down below the surface. What's holding up all this water? the water between the surface and the outflow point. This is supported by pressure. We have pressure. Acts upward. We have some force exerted by pressure. Okay. And it's equal to what? Pressure times the cross section area, isn't it? Why is that? Pressure is force per unit area. Meaning if you multiply force by area, I'm sorry, uh, if you multiply pressure by area, you get force. So it follows. Pressure times the area of the cylinder got equal to the weight of the water. Because the weight of the water is, of course, exerted by gravity on all this water. If the tube is blocked, the water's not going anywhere, right? So the pressure is what's holding up the water. Okay. Now, once you unblock the tube, the water is moving slowly. It's actually accelerating. It's got a negative acceleration. It's slowing down. Okay. So what I'm about to say is quite true. We'll take the uh, account of that shortly. This water is pretty much in equilibrium if it's descending slowly. It's descending slowly without any jumps and stuff, then its acceleration is nearly zero. So it's nearly in equilibrium. So the pressure 
times the area of the cylinder is the force that holds the supports the water. Okay, well, it's the weight of the water divided by the air in the cylinder. Weight of the water is how much force the pressure has to exert. Area of the cylinder is the area of the surface of which the pressure is exerted. Okay. Well, what's the weight of the water? Load times the volume of water. Volume of the water is the cross section area of the cylinder times the height. Basic idea about volume. You multiply the cross section area by the altitude, you get the volume. So it's row time the double. Okay. This is for any stationary fluid. So this is something you can always use if the fluid is stationary. And got to multiply the mass, which is the area of the cylinder, times the volume. Uh, Times G to get a force right. Put gravity off. Okay. Pressure's row G H. Not just row H. Again, density times the volume gives you the mass of the water. You got to multiply that by gravity. You get the weight, right? You get the force. Okay, so. And let's look at what happens now in the tube. Now pressure acts in all directions. You can convince yourself of that by taking a sandwich bag and sealing it and poking little holes in it with a pin and then squeezing it. Water comes out perpendicular to the surface at every point. You really ought to do that. Don't poke a bunch of tiny holes, fill it with water, seal it, and squeeze it. Hopefully not on your living room carpet, in the bathtub or something, okay? Or in a sink. As long as you don't squeeze too hard, it sprays all over the kitchen floor and gets in trouble. Okay. Water will escape your fingers in any direction. If you squeeze something semi-solid, some slime or something like that, it'll 
square out between the fingers. We'll square out, if you squeeze it this way, it'll square out this way. And down this hand, it'll square out this way. If you hold it this way, it'll square out this way, and this way, and this way. It's a flux that's always perpendicular to the surface. Think about that from the non verbal calculus. Okay, anyhow, you got your two here. So now you've got your pressure. Which is rho GH. Okay. That's actually that plus the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay. So I'm going to make a little distinction here. I say this is true. But you've also got the whole atmosphere sitting on top of this tube pushing down. Okay. So the actual pressure is rho GH plus the pressure of the atmosphere. On this side, still have the pressure of the atmosphere. Air is just like water, it's just less dense. So you got to put all that air above us. And of course, the air above us has a decreasing density as you go up. It's a little more complicated to get the expression for the pressure of the atmosphere, but we assume that in this case, pressure of the atmosphere is pretty much the same everywhere. So certainly the pressure on top of that tube and the pressure or on top of the cylinder and the pressure pushing in on the tube are equal. And they kind of act in the opposite direction. So you got this pressure, you got this pressure. So the change in pressure between here and here is rho GH. So the net force of this chunk of water. Experience is a net force pressure times area of the tube, right? On this end, in this direction. On this end. That experiences the pressure of atmosphere times the area of the tube in the opposite direction. And that just becomes rho GH times the area of the tube. Now we're going to get back to energy because how much work is done on this chunk of water is goes from here to here. Let L be the length of the tube. Four times the length, right? 
No, we're making an implicit assumption here. We're making an implicit assumption there's no friction. There's friction in the tube. So this really isn't in that force. This is ideal. I'll say this is the ideal case. Work in the water in the tube is that force times the life of the tube. So when that works, it works maybe from that again, it can work out of it. And one half mv squared minus one half mv naught squared. For v naught is zero. You're assuming the speed of the water inside the container is zero and then it gets accelerated up to whatever the exit velocity is. So there's a chunk of water inside the tube here that's going to replace a chunk of water here. This chunk of water is going to be accelerated by this net force. It's going to achieve a velocity. Okay. The initial velocity is zero. The final velocity, the velocity with which this thing exits the tube. Well, what's the mass of the water in that tube? I'm going to pause the video for a second and talk about it. Okay, we just stopped for a little discussion. We determined that the mass of the water, well, the mass here is the mass of what? It's what's being accelerated, which is the water in the tube, right? Water in the tube experiences a net force equal to this pressure times the cross sectional area minus this pressure times the cross sectional area, which just comes out to rho GH times the cross sectional area in the tube, right? So, what's the mass of the water in the tube? Well, I'll use V2 for volume of the tube, right? Now we have a discussion. What's the volume of the tube? Well, this comes down to the basic thing. We have a uniform cross section, which we're doing the tube. You multiply the cross sectional area by the altitude officially. Now, the tube in this direction doesn't look like an altitude, but it's geometrically an altitude. An altitude is a dimension perpendicular to your cross section. Okay. So, about, and you need, to, you need to understand that. That's important. Okay. So there we have it. That's the mass. Well, we don't need much room to figure out the exit now. What are we going to do? We've got this equation here. We've got a mass now we can put into this equation, right? Well, I'm going to ask you to do that. Put that mass into the equation and solve for the exit. Okay, so we're going to solve this for Vx, right? So Vx equals what? Well, you've got the mass here, which is 
rho times A2 times L. We got F net times L over here. And we got the one half, right? Well, let's just solve this equation for Vx and squared without worrying about what M is. Because that's a little simpler than we substitute M, right? So that's going to be easy. It's two times F net times L over M, right? Just multiply both sides by two over M. And you get the square root of. F net times L times two over M. Okay. But M is this, and F net is this, because that's it. This is the net force, right? So this is F net. I wrote this small because it's very straightforward. And now we just got to plug in this for F net. This thing in blue parentheses comes from this. That's, an, that's what this is, right? And we divide by the mass, which is rho times the area of two times L. Simplify that. What do you get? Okay, well, you're a lot of stuff in common. A2 and A2, L and L, row and row. None of those matter. They all divide out. And you just end up with the square root of two. H. Which is how fast the water would be going if it was dropped from height H, it's how fast it would be going when it gets down to the level of two. <clears throat> you get that by simple energy conservation, or you can use the equation of motion with acceleration G. You will find that that's the speed of an object drop distance H. Doesn't depend on its mass. Okay, it depends only on acceleration of gravity and the height. Equation of motion gives that to you. Energy analysis gives that to you. So we did all this. Come up with this. Okay. Well. I'm going to write down an equation for you, and then suggest that you can read your text and understand where the Newley's equation comes from. Um, and somehow the thing has gone out of focus again. Oh, on it. I get in the picture. I understand that that might want to focus on me. And I can't tell from this distance whether it's in focus or not. Okay, there it's in focus. Um, okay, I'm looking for more to write this on. Thank you.
It looks like the energy conservation in the fluid. OGH plus one half rho v squared plus p. Good heavens. This thing just lost its mind completely. All I'm saying is a white cloud that I've written. The most profound thing you've seen here in physics. Gamma has no respect. Okay. Now, Okay, this is like potential energy plus kinetic energy plus work. I'm not going to draw out all the parallels here. Pressure. Just like work. For you the following. Okay. The change in rho GH is potential energy for volume. And in some mysterious way, pressures like work per unit of volume might like draw that out for you, but we don't want to confuse that detail today. Just kind of accept that idea for the moment. And the camera is out of focus again. Oh, it was in focus and I moved it. Oh, why did I do that? This is getting old. I knew what I was doing to make that happen. As soon as something I was doing, I had to be able to stop. Okay. Why is this potential energy for volume? Well, if you multiply rho GH by volume, you get mGH, right? Because rho times volume is mass. Same thing here. Here it's a little more complicated. Except it. conservation of energy. This is Bernoulli's equation.
Okay. 